Welcome back to Save Podcasts, where we capture conversations over coffee. My name is Corey. I'm Amia. And today, a um, little special episode. Christmas special. Christmas like special. That's, yeah, that's like that's yeah. what it's going to be. This is our Christmas special, where um, it's just us. Um, we don't have anyone joining us besides the Lord. I was literally just going to say that. That's so, okay, so good. Uh, the Holy Spirit. He's here also. Which is the same person. Yep. Three and one. Um, so, did I say it? What? Remember in LTC when we're getting yelled at by Oh, Adam yeah, yeah, yeah. Calling the Holy Spirit it? I don't think so. I think you said. He is a person. I think you said he, yeah. Well, Adam, if you're listening to this, I said he. <laughs> Anyways, um, we wanted to... Um, well, we've been gone for a little bit and that's for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's just go through them. One reason LTC was, um, taking up quite a bit of time for some of us. Yeah. For me, (laughs) um, thought I'd focus on that. And, um, also the, I think before that was, uh, we were going to record an episode. Then I got sick. Yeah. And uh Corey like died, could not yeah. be awakened. Resurrected. Yeah. You know? Praise God. And so then yeah, L T C final and then I think even before that, yeah, before the L T C final, you went To India. To India. Yeah. Yeah. That's a odd vacation choice. Yeah. And that's yeah. what everyone else told me. Also, we had um a loss. Close to home, our senior pastor of our church, Keith McCallum, passed away. Um, That was right before Thanksgiving, I believe, Mm -hmm. or right after. So within the week. Yeah. Um, And so that was definitely devastating and uh, basically consumed my thought life for a week or two after. And so, and... Uh, the week, yeah, it was just it was just a hard time, mm-hmm. and so we decided to take a little break and not stress ourselves out. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you were wondering, oh, I haven't seen any podcasts recently. Are they done? Have they just totally given up on this? The answer is yes. no. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we're done well, right now. Well, this is it. This is our yeah, announcement. So goodbye. No. Yep. <clears throat> um. We plan to continue on until, um, let's see, until the rapture. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We'll be here even after we die, potentially. We'll be making podcasts up in heaven. Yeah. We'll be interviewing people. We'll be like, what was it like down on earth? That would be so fun. Let's do it. God, I pray that that can happen. Amen. When two or more are gathered. Exactly. And we have three, actually, as we have discussed. Yeah. Um, today we're also holding mics and not yeah. uh, mounted to the table. Um, reason for that is that there is currently a party going on. It is a DC deck building. So it's a, a card game based around DC comics. Um, so there's like a tournament going on. For Monica's birthday. Shout out, Monica. For birthday. Mon- for Monica's birthday. Mm-hmm. Which is on Christmas Eve. Um, and it's also a fundraiser. Right. I totally knew that. Yeah, I think it's a fundraiser. Okay, that's dope. But um, we wanted to um, make this podcast um, to talk about two things. One, um, talk about Keith, um, and we'll talk about your trip to India more so. Um, so before that, yeah, let's talk about... The good old man, Keith. Mm -hmm. So I've known him for, um, I mean, since I first started coming around back in 2005. But uh, I knew of him, you know, then. But I never started to um, befriend him um, until I was in high school. I think it was early high school, right before then. Yeah, I was like pretty much freshman year of high school because he was a, uh, really into the high school group because we would all go over to his house after mm-hmm. high school. 
and we would hang out and destroy his house. <laughs> but he, we would also do um, guys' nights at his house on Saturday nights. We would go after we would like after CT. We would go do an activity. Then we would all go back to um, Keith's house because Connor was with us too, and so we would all go spend the night there. And uh, it was like clockwork, where we would we would go over there. It would probably be around like ten, eleven p.m. And we would be there'd be like twenty of us guys. We'd all be hanging out, smoking cigs on the back porch. <laughs> Classic. Um, playing different games. And then right about three to four AM, Keith would wake up <laughs> and he'd be like, All right, you guys ready? And then we would all just be like just anticipating the moment when Keith woke up so he can just take us out at a weird adventure. Oh. Um I remember uh, many of them, um, but they were all at just random places. Uh, one time we went, like, drove like an hour somewhere. I think one time we went to Columbus. Um, but, yeah, usually it would be West Branch. Yeah. What was uh, your favorite adventure? Um, one I remember specifically, I'm trying to remember where it was located. But it was when I first got my license. Um, I had my mom's car. It was like a stick shift SUV. It's a very weird car. Hmm. But I remember being excited um, to be able to drive to the wherever we were going. And so I, I remember Richie Fresh, um, Rich Hagar, Hagar. I was gonna say that. That feels. I wrong. always say Hagar. Hagar. Rich Hagar. Hagar. Um, yep. Rich Hagar. <laughs> um, he was there, and he drove his big van. Um, that's when he had that big white van. Yeah. Um, I think it was the Morsh's old van. That's what I remember now. The Marshmallow. The Marshmallow, yes. And then Keith had the Gladiator. And then I had my SUV, so I drove with a few friends. And then Keith communicated with Richie that let's try to lose Corey because he just got his license. That's hilarious. And I don't know if they communicated it or if they were. I'm pretty sure they did because we were flying (laughs) through back roads. And I mean, at top speeds, like 70 miles an hour, just flying through roads that we shouldn't be going that fast. (laughs) And I was proud of myself. I kept up. And we drove um, off to this place. So Keith's MO was he would take us to these adventures. And um, I think this was the adventure where it was like a haunted place. He like, he's like, I don't know if I can, like, I remember we um, we were like five minutes out and he pulled over to the side of the road. We all got out. Like, what's going on? He's like, uh, I'm just overthinking this this kind of scary place and so he's like getting in all of our heads like, yeah yeah classic we're just like no 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 we can handle it. we can handle it and he's like okay but you guys have to listen to me mm-hmm. because i don't know what's really going to happen here and so he was just hiking up the story he was really good at that yeah um and i think it's called hell town or mm. that's what he called it yeah yeah um but it's just like place in the woods and there's like this like a a the couple barn. little abandoned barns yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. It is officially Helltown. Helltown, yeah. yeah. And so he took us there, and he was, I mean, he was scaring the shit out of us yeah. for sure. Um, it was very spooky. But, um, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, there was one time it was like we we were driving back at like 6 in the morning. And, wow. Uh, um, I remember M- Matt Oaks being in the car. It was the first time I met him and we were driving back from West Branch and I was right by the sheets in Kent and I was at the stoplight and I just fell asleep at the stoplight. Oh my God. So That's insane. And then, uh, but yeah, that's some good adventures. Um, but yeah, I worked for Keith for a while and uh, I think a total, or, I mean, Work for Keith, meaning I worked for fellowship, but Keith was my 
direct report Mm -hmm. and because he was the only one on staff at the time full time and so I was the intern from 2013 until 2000 what had that been 2018 sure um and then I worked at uh another place worked at Park Source for two years and then um we got this building and they're like hey why don't you come work for fellowship again mm-hmm. and help out this building? And that was like a dream come true. Still is. Yeah. So it's like, I would say roughly like, you know, however many years it is. Is that five, six, about seven years total? Anyways, I got to know him very well, especially. Wait, seven years since what? Seven years I've been working. Oh, Okay. Um, okay. For fellowship in total. I thought you were counting seven years from 2018, and I was like, bro, that is not, that's not <laughs> how that works. It's like 21 years. Yeah. No, but I've been working for fellowship for you know, like seven years. Before we got the building, uh, like right out of high school when I was working for him, I got to know him really well. And that's like, he was also discipling me at the time, as well as being my boss. So it kind of was like a difficult relationship to figure mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Because I viewed him as a father figure, and he was also my disciple. He's also my friend, but he was also my boss. Yeah, and also our pastor. It's like it's a fun mix. It's like my brain doesn't. It's it's very hard to be like, what do I treat you as today? Yeah, and like when he texts me, um, it's hard to like know like which title that I view as is texting me. But, yeah, uh, over time I've learned to be able to merge them all into one one single person is Keith. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. You know, but that took some time. Anyways, my favorite times with Keith, he uh, was, he would take me out to uh, camping, like um, our Memorial Day when we used to go out to Pima Tuning, um, Labor Day camping at East mm-hmm. Harbor. We would go out there a few days early, went whitewater rafting a few days early, and we talked together. That was like a really cool time. Um, but... It was just like one-on-one time, just me and Keith hanging out at this RV. And I'll share one story that's like my favorite. I shared with a bunch of people. Um, But uh, it's it's definitely my favorite funny story with Keith is that it was the first time he got the RV. Everyone knows about this RV (laughs) that knows Keith. Um, And it was like in pristine condition at the time. And he really, really wanted this RV. Oh, yeah. It was was the study bus. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I got this. It was a 1997 Holiday Rambler, I believe, or Holiday Vacationer. That's a um, good name. Yeah. Either one. So it was like, you know, it's dated, but it looked pretty good. Anyways, he just got it, and uh, the week after, it was like, or it's at least within a month, we took it to mm-hmm. Lake Erie for camping, and me and Keith get down there Wednesday night, and we're driving. We drove that thing down. Another funny story is that um, the if you go over 55 miles an hour in the RV, uh, it shakes. Nice. And so we found this out, um, and it was the scariest thing yeah. that I've ever been through. Yeah. Because it's not like, oh, it's like something's like a little Rattling. off. No, like this is like an earthquake level shaking go, going like on the highway if you're going 60 miles an hour and just hit a bump it's like and everything is shaking that's her and i just remember sitting in the passenger seat he's in the driving seat and it starts shaking and then he is screaming like <laughs> <laughs> and then so i'm terrified because i'm like i've never seen keith this scared before yeah and he is just screaming like just like trying to get this over to the side of the road and I was like, what the hell is happening? I mean, it's really funny to look back on, but it was like one yeah. of the most scary moments. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we get down to East Harbor, and he's like, I got to figure out how to dump this thing. Like dump all the gray water, black water, mm-hmm. which is basically, black water is uh, sewage. It's, you know, yeah. pee. Gray water is like uh, from the shower and uh, from the sink and stuff like that. So he's like, I got to figure out how to dump these before we go and park it in the campsite. So we pull up to the station that's inside the campsite and where we lift up the compartment and 
we're trying to like figure everything out and he's like i think this hose goes here and uh there's a bunch of buttons and he's like i think if you just pull this out and so nothing was attached but he pulls this lever and oh, gallons no. of brown chunky water no <laughs> comes I mean, from like, it seemed like it was like from a fire hydrant pressure. Just that is so nasty. And so we're both like leaning down in this cabinet and looking at it. And when he pulled it, it just all sprayed up and oh. it hit like it hit the bottom of the cabinet and went up and hit my lips. Oh, and so that's so nasty. Yeah, <laughs> it was disgusting. And so I immediately. I, I withdraw from the situation. Yeah, Keith is screaming yeah. like, no, 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 no. And try to get this hose connected. Um, were people like watching this happen? No, it's just me and him. It's oh. like at night. Praise God. And so I'm like, as soon as it hits my lip, I'm just like, Ugh, and just like want to barf. And mm-hmm. so I just go around. I go inside the RV, grab this two liter Fanta because that's all I had. I just pour it all over myself to shower <laughs> in Fanta. And I'm just like gagging. <laughs> and then hilarious. he finally gets the hose on. And so he's covered. Oh, my God. And the worst part was this, like, characterizes uh, Keith's humor very well, Mm -hmm. is that he loves messing with people. Um, Yeah. He gets a kick out of it. And so, I mean, for the longest time, um, I was just like, dude, that was shit. (laughs) Like, we just got covered in shit. He's like, no, 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 no. It wasn't. It was just just some nasty water. Mm. I'm like. Dude, you smelled it. I know you smelled <laughs> it with me. That wasn't just water. That was that was poop, dude. We just got covered oh my in God. poop. And he's like, "Oh my God, you're such a wussy." Like that was just <laughs> water, and and uh, he would always make fun of me. And yeah, I would never win that argument. I knew it was poop mm-hmm. for years and years. I would bring the story up, and he would always make fun of me. Just like it was just water. You're just scared, your little baby. <laughs> and That's then finally, hilarious. like a year ago, he admits it. <laughs> and I was like, do you remember when we were dumping the RV? And he's, and he's just started cracking up. He's like, we got covered in shit, didn't we? <laughs> and I'm like, he finally admit it. That's so funny. And so he was gaslighting me. Yeah, yeah. Um, But yeah, Keith, uh, to just wrap it up here, Um, for my portion, if you want to add anything, of course you can. Um, but Keith was very influential in my life, uh, among many others in our fellowship. Um, just, uh, personally, it was, it was the hardest death I had to go through mm-hmm. in my life to date. Um, and, uh, he definitely meant a lot to me and, uh, wouldn't be, um, uh, working for fellowship without him. He's the mm-hmm. one that fought to get me back. Yeah. Um, and. I'm definitely like indebted to the McCallum family, especially Keith, just of how much they've uh, sacrificed and uh, loved me and helped me, you know, ultimately be able to get married. I Like I wouldn't have a degree if it wasn't for mm-hmm. Keith. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be married if it wasn't for Keith and uh, wouldn't have this job, like my dream job. So I, w- I wouldn't have so many things and I would have, you know, a fraction of the character yeah. that I have today because he's taught me a lot. Um, and so it is very hard, but I'm also very glad that uh, he is not suffering anymore. Mm-hmm. He was uh, battling with pancreatic cancer for three years. And so he was on and off, had a few surgeries. And so this was um, very difficult for the whole family and especially Keith. But um, at the end, he was... A lot of us, um, even Dar, his wife, and his son Kyle, and Connor, and Sean, um, everyone's praying mm-hmm. that uh, he, would, the Lord, would just take him. And so, it's, it's very, I'm, I'm glad that he's no longer suffering. Yeah. Um, but it's a hard loss for sure, and mm-hmm. I'm just one of the many that have uh, been impacted by Keith. So. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything. There yeah. Or? Yeah. I mean, like I've, I have never really had like a personal relationship with Keith because I am a child basically. Um, but I mean, I've known 
him for a very long time ever since I started going to this church. Like, yeah, basically my whole life. And I have like very distinct memories of him that are just like really funny and wild. And like, that is my encapsulation of who he was in that sense. Like, I just remember, I don't know when I was like in middle school, just being so enthralled at CT, like watching him teach and just be like, wow, this man is really saying these things up here. Like I, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll scratch this one for the record. But I remember when he was teaching about like Samson and Delilah for no reason. And he was talking about, he was talking about Dar and he was like, she's my Delilah. And he was just like going on and on and on, like really giving some detail that like we did not want to know about <laughs> Samson and Delilah being like him and Dar. But it was just like crazy. And I remember like if my friends ever came to CT, I was like, yeah, this is my pastor and he's pretty cool. Yeah. Which was of course true. He just like, he was a firecracker. So it was always like the best to hear him teach CT. And he just had so much passion, which was really cool. But I think like, the like he inadvertently did impact me because he built up a lot of people that are very important in my life like yeah. most of them but especially my dad like he and my dad were really close and the stories that I've heard from my dad of being rebuked by Keith mm -hmm. and just like Keith saying the most blunt and truthful and loving things to him that yeah. he really I think probably helped shape him into the person that he is and the dad that he is which of course like I mean Obviously, like that credit goes to the Lord too, but I'm super grateful yeah. that he took the time to do that for my dad and help steer him in the right direction of raising his kids and whatever. Like, that's just so cool. And it's yeah. really, it's cool to see how like the effect that he has on people trickles down. Like even with Theo, like I remember he literally told my dad that he was raising Theo for the devil, <laughs> which like my dad was like, oh, you're right. That's a good point. And it like helped him redirect and see what he was doing and probably has helped Theo too, which is really mm -hmm. cool. Um, and I think like, I don't know, I was kind of thinking about just like memories that I have with him, which are not very many, but one thing that I just think is like so funny and so Keith is like a year ago, almost exactly. We were staying in this like hotel mm. thing, I guess with like the elders families and he was eating like this hostess cinnamon bun thing and he had like a tub of margarine and he was just like slapping it on this cinnamon bun and he just like was had a whole tray of them that he was just eating and he just like looked <laughs> at me and he was like it doesn't matter i'm gonna die soon <laughs> it was just like so funny because it's like that's that's a really fucking good point <laughs> like yeah i'm gonna eat whatever i want because i'm gonna die <laughs> but it just i don't know it was so classically him and then i remember too like this was like two months ago or something, but I was on the phone with Caitlin and I was just like telling her about a situation and asking for her advice and whatever. And she was at family night with Keith and with Kyle and their whole family, obviously. And I remember she was like, Oh, I got to hang up because Keith has something he wants to say. So she like hung up mm -hmm. with me and then she came back and she's like, okay, so Keith and Kyle wanted me to tell you blah, 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 blah. And like they gave me advice through Caitlin through the phone, which was just like, this was two months ago. Like the man was not doing well, but he yeah. still took the time to like have Caitlin explain what we were talking about on the phone and then call me back to give me this advice that yeah. he had. I don't know. I just was like this. It's such a small thing, but it's like a really good encapsulation of like, he just cared. Yeah. And he was like, so on the Lord's page that he just, he almost like knew exactly what to say all yeah. the times, which was really cool. And the advice that he did give through that was really helpful and helped me like be able to think clearer through that situation and whatever. Yeah. So I don't know, like I think probably everyone that, well, certainly everyone that's in our fellowship has been affected by him, whether they know it or not, but probably most people also have a story of that too, yeah. which is just like, what, what more would you want out of life to have like yeah. that many people be able to say that they have affected you? Like, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely left, um, a great legacy behind and uh until his last days like yeah uh, until he was physically unable to like communicate um he was trying to build up people yeah and um i'll m make this the last point then we can move on to your trip to india um a big point that they brought up at the um, memorial service um, especially connor and kyle um, brought up how yeah, Keith was a great guy, but he also wanted everyone to know, like, he wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a lot of flaws. Um, and he was human. Yeah. 
and it's it's a i just think his uh, life is a cool testament to be like here's an unperfect normal guy um yeah just like the rest of us that was just willing to serve the yeah, lord yeah absolutely and uh yeah he was a firecracker yet yeah, he said some wild things some at wild CC. things <laughs> yeah um but he also uh said some really powerful uh life-changing things at yeah. CT through yeah. his teachings and so um yeah like that i think uh it's he left a great legacy behind of um he impacted so many people just yeah. like at the memorial service the amount of people that showed up yeah it was really cool um, and just had um i remember we we met up after the memorial service with a bunch of people that he discipled um and we went to silver springs cuz keith was a big outdoor camper guy and uh he went to silver springs a lot and was camping there a lot so we we were able to get it get in there and we had a fire and then it was like 20 of us just sat around a campfire just telling stories and funny stories and um how keith has like impacted us just uh as a remembrance and um for us to mourn too you know mm-hmm. it, was, it was a way for us to bring it into reality that this is the he is gone yeah uh, but it was it's just really crazy just hearing all these stories and um pretty wild to see the power of the lord working through this man mm-hmm. and how many people he's impacted so yeah so rest in peace keith mm-hmm. um and yeah so moving on india you went to india who did you go with i went with my mom and lena morsher and what was the purpose of your trip good question Essentially, my mom does like off and on work for IGL, which is a nonprofit called India Gospel League, and they I just lead. Realized I burped in the mic, and I'm s- sorry for all. Do, you, do you want me to? I can re-say that. <laughs> uh, no, it's. I mean, we're raw and uncut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for that part that we just cut. Yeah. Um. Anyway, unimportant. IGL India Gospel League, but they do a lot of work. Their main goal is like obviously to spread the gospel in India, but they're. Why are you smiling? <laughs> I just like am realizing how stupid I am, and but I am listening. No, it's, it's okay. Their it's main just purpose stressing is me out. to spread the gospel yes, in India. Yes, yes, and they want to build up like indigenous leaders, which essentially just means the people that are actually there. So not like kind of the typical American view of missionary work, where it's like we're bringing in the people and they're going to do the things, but they're really, really about like we're going to take the people that are already here and. Like, these are their people. This is their land. And we're going to train them and equip them to do that. And if I remembered that verse that's in Philippians that is, like, their basis for the work, I would share it. But I don't. But it's in there, and it's about the training and equipping of believers, essentially. Um, It's also in 2 Tim. Yes. Actually, that's probably what I'm thinking of. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What is it? I did memorize that one day, and I don't anymore. It's about how... All scripture is God breathed. Is that the one? And is useful for a, instructing, equipping. That is a verse, but. Training in righteousness, something like that? Yeah, that is a verse. And we it's can say that point. applies. Same yes, point. okay. Paul wrote it. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. You're right. Point is, they want to train and equip and spread the gospel. And ironically, this is not ironic, actually, but Sam Stevens, who's like the founder of this, he has all these acronyms and he has one that very well explains what I'm trying to say. So maybe just go look on their website and check it out because I cannot explain things well. IGL.com. Yes. Um, But they also do a lot of work like just with the communities. And I mean, it's a mostly Hindu nation. And a lot of the stuff that they do do is like working with Hindus because they're the people that live in the nation and they want to support that. Well, support the people, I guess. Um, so the reason that we went was because my mom is doing work for them to create a training module, essentially. Mm -hmm. I believe it's like a six week module or something like that of instructing people on what is happening in India right now, because there is a lot of persecution from the government, which is like kind of hidden. Like a lot of people, it's not really talked about. People don't really know it because like parts of it are intentionally hidden and it's just like, I don't know. People don't find international news all that exciting a lot of the time. So essentially it's to shed light on what's going on and how people can best support that. And also just kind of informing them like what IGL actually does, because that way people can know what they're getting themselves involved with and know just like 
that the Lord is really doing a lot of work there, which there was a book that Sam just wrote called Unleashed, which talks about that a lot. It talks about the persecution. It talks about the fact that like God is working in India. And I, before I had went, I started reading that book and I was just so convinced like the mm. Lord is doing something here. Like he's spreading across India, like wildfire, like unlike anything we've seen here before. Mm. And then in going there, I, of course that was confirmed for me, but it's essentially just like raising awareness about all the things that I just said. And she'll be done with that at some point. So if you are interested, you could take this training module and it would be really cool because you can learn all these things and learn how you can support being here in the United States or wherever you are, I guess for like random listener in Australia. Mm. Um, I still haven't explained why we went there <laughs> because she needed to get interviews with people from different parts of IGL to understand what they do, to understand the persecution that they're going throughout, whatever. So essentially the majority of the trip, aside from a couple of days, was her doing interviews with different pastors, people who work for IGL, people who have been served by IGL, mm. things like that. But simultaneously, this is kind of funny because she was like, maybe I'm going to go to India for this work trip and maybe you can come with me. And I was like, cool. So she was talking to Sam about it, the founder. And he was like, okay, so I don't really have anything going on like November 7th to no November 17th. Like that'd be a good time for you guys to come. She was like, okay, cool. And like two weeks later, he's like, we also have like one of our biggest pastors conference of the entire year happening during those weeks, <laughs> yeah. but like no big deal. Yeah. But also you guys should teach at this conference, by the way, because you're going to be there during Amazing. this giant pastors conference. So that was also a part of it, but that was only like a couple of days that we were there. Mm. So, um, yeah, let's talk about the the teaching. So, mm -hmm. um, what did you teach on? That's a really good question, Corey. Mm. Oh Lord, um, I taught on. So the theme of the conference was the unshakable kingdom, mm -hmm. which you can read about in Hebrews twelve, and it's really cool. So I recommend that you do. But my teaching, if I remember correctly, was on how. The church manifests kingdom authority and power. So that was like the title or description or whatever that was given to me to mm -hmm. teach on, but essentially just how the church and the people in the church have all these promises that are made to them manifesting the power and authority of God, mm. basically. Um, which teaching was like a whole experience because many, many reasons. Um, one, I didn't finish my teaching until 6 a.m. that day. And I had like weeks, bro. I had time. Okay. And like one night I was like trying to work on this teaching because I had, and by weeks, I mean, I actually had like seven days, but that's still a lot of time. And I was trying to work on it when I was still at home and I was like losing my shit. I was like, I can't do this. It was probably spiritual attack. And I was just like going crazy. So I gave up and I was like, whatever, I'll do it on the plane. Turns out I was throwing up the whole time. Basically didn't do it oh, on the yeah. plane. Um, then we got to a hotel I was still dying, so still wasn't working on my teaching. Then I was jet lagged. Then all these things kept happening, so still didn't work on my teaching. Mm. Still didn't know when I was teaching. Didn't even know if I was going to get there in time to teach. So I was kind of just like, whatever, we're going to go with the flow. And I get there, and they're like, maybe you'll teach tomorrow. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll teach tomorrow. <laughs> I did not teach tomorrow. Praise the Lord, because I did not have a teaching. That's good. Yeah. So then the next morning, I was like, okay, <laughs> I have to wake up, and I have to work on this teaching. And then I like kind of finished it. But I also didn't know like how much time I would have to give this teaching. And I didn't know until the day before that it was going to go through two different translators, which is crazy, by the way, because it's literally like I would say one sentence and then you would say one sentence and then someone else would say one sentence and then I can say one sentence again, which when you're trying to make a point is yeah. like incredibly difficult to do, especially because they kept telling me like, you need to slow down. You have to give shorter sentences. And everything in me was like, no, because I just need to make like one whole point. Mm -hmm. So essentially like I had probably like, I don't know because I didn't even practice and I didn't time it, but I probably had like 40 minutes of content Wow. for maybe like an hour time <laughs> slot. I didn't even know. But when you have 40 minutes times three, it's like a lot of time yeah. that I did not have. But get this because also we show up late and when we get there, Somebody's already talking. So they keep talking, right? And then they're like, your turn. And I was like, hey, how much, how much time do I have for this teaching? No answer. Because anytime I asked anyone about how much time I had for anything or what time anything was, no one knows how to answer that question, apparently. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. There must be some cultural difference that I don't get. But like, 
I just never got answers to those things. So I just went up there, no idea how much time I have, but knowing that I don't have the full amount of time that I thought that I did, and I don't know how much time my content is going to be. So I just start going. I'm like in my intro, and then they're like, hey, you need to like hurry up. And I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) What do you mean I need to hurry up? And so I asked them like read this passage, and they're like, we don't have time. You just need to skip it. So I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to skip this. That's cool. And then I don't even know what happened. I just like said some words and read some things. And I don't even know if it was good. Like, it's really hard to tell because they can't even like, the words that I'm saying mean nothing to them. They're hearing it in their own language. Like they don't even get to see my expression or anything because it's not even coming from my mouth really. So I have no idea. I have no idea what happened. I just like fully blacked out and I hope that the Lord used it and I hope that there was fruit there. Well, I know he used it because I was there. No. Oh, Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because uh, two signs um, that he probably used it is um, I've heard many teachers black out and be like, I totally don't under, like, I don't even know what I said at that point. Yeah. And that's usually when the Holy Spirit's like, I'm going to, I'm going to drive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you just go sit down? I hope so. Um, So I've heard that plenty of times. Yeah. Also, um, even if it was, the worst teaching you ever gave. Yeah. The Lord's like, let me show you what I can do with that. Yeah. Um, and so I doubt it was, um, I doubt it was bad because yeah. the Lord is good. Yeah. And honestly, like, I don't think my delivery was that great or whatever, but like they couldn't even tell, which is awesome. Like they were just literally hearing the points I was making and the verses that I said that I think were biblical mm. points and verses. So and it's probably good. Yeah. I was like, whatever. And everyone just kept <clears> telling me like, they're just encouraged by the fact that you were here, yeah. which I did not believe until I got there. And everyone was like, so, so, so excited. Mm. But also I, something that was like remarkable, but remarkable about that to me is that like, I, I'm a control freak. Like I'm a cleric. So I, I yeah. And like, I, I am an anxious worrier and I like to have a plan for everything. So the fact that I didn't have this teaching till 6 AM, hmm. like, In normal life, I would be like shitting myself consistently for (laughs) hours, but I was not. And I wasn't even freaked out about the fact that I didn't even know when I was teaching. I was just like, okay, cool. Like I'm teaching at 11. I'm teaching at one. Like, I don't know, but okay. And then I got there and I was like, okay. Yeah. I I mean, just a little sidetrack off that. I used to be like that too, Mm -hmm. with teaching specifically. Um, I'm usually like a last minute guy and a procrastinator. Yeah. Same. Good at managing with that. I'm comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But when, with teachings, I used to get hyper anxious and worry about it and just panic and take full control of the teaching Yeah, to make sure that I have it down. And it wasn't until uh, I listened to, well, Kyle made a podcast with Ian about making a teaching. And mm. uh, this uh, it was also like working with Kyle on a teaching before too. I learned to basically just re- how to rely on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it's not that, oh, yeah, just procrastinate and don't care about it. And just, yeah. Like, that's not what it is at all. But it's rather that I know the material. I studied for it. I put the work in. But when it comes to the day of, you know, I just I just make an outline. But I just I have to shut down like a couple hours before the actual teaching because I'm like, if I do any more, then I'm going to panic and yeah. take control again. Yeah. And so I have to let, uh, I have to leave room for the spirit to take control. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a weird, um, thing for, especially for non-Christians, but, um, for newer believers too. Like, what does that actually look like? What does it actually mean? Um, and it's kind of like one of those things where you have to live it to understand it. Yeah. And, uh, that's been very successful for me and very successful for other teachers. Yeah. Um, and so. It is a cool aspect where the the Lord does want to help out there. That's yeah. one big thing that He's like, "Please let me take control in this because mm-hmm. this is my area, and I'm you're not gonna impact people's hearts. I am." Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think like in general, as I've just taught, like I have let go of a lot, a lot of control that I used to want to take, and have like, I don't really get that nervous before I teach anymore. And if I do, that's probably because I just like, I'm not trusting the Lord and something has gone wrong, but like, I still know that I'm teaching at eight 30 on a 
Thursday night. Yeah. Like I, I have some semblance of like comfortability at least, but like to get in front of people I have never met before that do not speak my language when I have just gotten off a plane like two seconds ago, like yeah. you know, Amia does not mm-hmm. like that. That is like peak uncomfortability. And also like I had like one piece of rice in my body because <laughs> I was like dying and I was not eating food. So that's not really important, but it just was like a whole new level of like, I cannot do anything about this yeah. and I'm just here. And I, I knew that I was going to teach and I know that maybe I'm going to be asked to teach again mm. And that's just what I'm going to do. And I'm here. That was pretty much it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and so some other things. Um, you interviewed some people. Is that correct? I did not. My mom did. Were you present? Yes. Um, is there any interviews without saying names uh, that uh, stuck out to you and that you want to share about? Yeah. Um that is a good question. Honestly, for a lot of her inter- interviews, we, it was like kind of hard to hear because we had to like, I don't know, for whatever reason, like it was hard to pay attention and hard to hear the translators, but experiences that I had with people that were not in an interview, but people's stories that stuck out to me. I think there was this one guy that I was talking to at the conference um, and he was a pastor and he was super young. Like one of the younger pastors I saw that he was probably like in his late twenties or something. Hmm. And he was just telling me about his church and all these things. And he was talking to me, me and Lena and he, he was like, so, so excited that we like wanted to know things about his life. And there was like these beautiful mountains that were behind the conference center. And so he was telling us about these mountains and he was telling us about the waterfalls and all these things. And he was like, so, so excited about this. Like (laughs) he was just like, his whole face was like lit up the whole time. And then we just like get further in the conversation. He's telling us about his experience as a pastor Mm. and just like with a full smile on his face, he was like, and they beat me and they beat me here and they beat me here and they beat me here. And he's like showing us the places on his body where like he was beat by people that came to his church and just like beat him up because he was Mm. preaching the word of God, which is like, as I have come to learn a very, very normal thing. Like that is just, if people know you're a Christian in this village, you're probably going to get beat up. That's what's going to happen. But like, Mm that was just so shocking to me and like that was one of our first days there just to see this guy like so excited so happy the smile never left his face to just like so casually just tell us about how he was being beaten for his faith Hmm. like that was just really pretty astonishing I don't even really know what to make of that but another thing I mean I, I I don't know you guys just have to take the training module because like the stories the ones that I didn't even hear And I won't even bother to summarize them because you just need to go listen to these people tell them because they are crazy. Like, there's a story about a guy getting raised from the dead. There's a story about a guy who almost killed himself and then the Lord spoke to him and he came back down. He got beat up by a cop for not killing himself. Like, crazy, crazy things are happening here. Um, But one of our team members, I guess you could say, that we were with, uh, she shared her testimony to us just kind of briefly. And she grew up in like from the time she was like maybe 10 I don't really remember she grew up in one of their children's homes that IGL has where they like will build a home and they um you used to be able to do like a one-on-one sponsorship with these kids but they will like give them three meals a day they'll teach them about the bible they'll teach them English they'll teach them like regular school things or whatever uh but she like I don't even remember what happened with her family but it was just some crazy stuff and she like ran away when she was really little and she was just like working in the streets as like a little kid. And then she like somehow got placed in this children's home, but then somehow like got separated from the children's home. I don't even remember what happened, but she was just like everything in her in this time period where she was not in the children's home. And she was just like working on the streets and sleeping in the streets and Mm. whatever was like, I need to get back to this place because this place is safe and this place is good. And she was just like, calling out to the Lord. She had no idea where she was, but she was like, I just need you to take me back. And so for like days, she's just like walking back to get to this children's home. And Mm. then she's there. And then it's actually really cool because then like the Stevens family essentially took her in and, and then raised her. And I don't know, I'm probably not really telling the story well, but it was just cool on a lot of accounts, but one to hear like the hope that these children's homes give to these kids. And she was telling us this after, after we had just visited one and met like 20 kids that were there, but like 
they are literally saving people's lives. Like they are feeding people who get maybe one meal a day and they're educating people who would otherwise have no hope of probably ever getting a good job or anything like that. And then they're of course like taking care of people's souls because they're telling them about Jesus, who is someone that they probably never heard of before. Yeah. And just to hear like her, her desperation and like, I need to get back to this place. And then the Lord literally led her there. Like she had no idea where she was like that. It's just it's crazy. And then she was like brought into this beautiful family Mm. and her life was like, she was essentially resurrected because her life was just like destined to be shit basically. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, how long were you there? Um, like with travel in total, it was like two weeks ish. And so you had the pastor's conference. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that was a few days you said, yeah, it was. So we, because of like literally so many complications, we got there like two days late and I cannot even recount those events because they were really so traumatic. Never, never want to get on a plane again. Um, but yeah, we got there two days late. So we only had like a day and a half ish for the conference, which was really like the best time ever. It was like literally so cool. Yeah. Um, and then it continued to still be the best time ever, but that was just a really special best time ever. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, so through that time, you had, you had the pastor's conference, you had flights, mm-hmm. you had um, going around interviewing people. Yeah, yeah. Um, were there any other highlights that you would like to share about? Yeah, Probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. There's like so many things. Well, that one, I don't one thing even... I did want to ask yeah, you because yeah. I, I think uh, it's always good reminder for me and mm-hmm. for people um, like me, which are many that are Christians that are uh, living in America and are just uh, like, oh, it's so hard being a Christian. Yeah. And yeah. worried about cancel culture and like upsetting people. Um, and then you go over into a third world country, um, primarily Hindu with, um, a very nasty government, Mm -hmm. um, uh, who persecute Christians, um, physically. And it's very, it's not just like a reputation loss. It's, uh, it's uh, torture. Um, and even people killing Christians. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a good wake up call for, uh, westernized yeah christianity yeah and so is there anything that you can uh say about that i know you shared about um that guy who was um being beaten for his faith yeah um but is there any more stories that uh were like a good uh wake up call because you've never been to india no um or experienced anything like this yeah so um yeah we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit well i think literally aspect literally aspect that's mm-hmm. not words. Literally every aspect of everything was a wake up call because yeah. like on one hand, everything's just really different. Like I, I mean, I've never been out of the country other than like Canada and that doesn't really count. Mm. But of course in any other culture, it's normal that things are really different, but like things were really, really different. Like pretty much nothing is the same. And there's all these like really minuscule things that I was like, Oh, this is just different. And I wouldn't have known that. So to see like still, how the Lord operates there in a place that's really different was really cool. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm describing. I think it just like everything was eye opening is basically my point. Mm. But I, I don't know because like for the specific stories, I cannot tell you them because they are too good and I can't say them with my own words because it'll suck. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to them when they get published or read unleashed or something. But definitely something that I noticed that was just like crazy to me and also super biblical, which makes a lot of sense is how, and I have said this to so many people and I told my home church this. And so I'm sorry if you're hearing me say it again, but I can't get over it. So like whatever. Um, but like the confidence that people have in the Lord is just really astonishing because here, like you said, we're just kind of like, Oh my God, life is so hard and whatever. But also, it's actually not that hard. And we have pretty much everything handed to us. And I also, Mm. you can read this in the bulletin also. I just remembered that I said the same thing. So I'm going to say this thing again, again. Anyway, like if I'm sick, right, I'm going to go to the doctor. If I am 
having a hard time, I'll go like talk to a friend or something. I pretty much have like all the resources. Not to say, okay, that was a bad example with the friend thing because obviously people have friends. But I have pretty much every resource I could ever need open to me at all times. Yeah, you it's can just, be very autonomous without the Lord. Yes, yeah. yes. I have just an incredible amount of privilege. And so there's a lot of that that just lends itself to like, I don't, I don't need the Lord in a lot of areas of my life. Or I think that I don't need the Lord in a lot yeah. of areas of my life, which is exactly what the Bible is saying when it says that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle yeah. or blessed are the poor, or the weak or whatever. Like that is exactly the point that he's making that when you actually in your life have like such deep need for anything, you're going to just be clinging to the Lord a hundred times more. Mm. And so to see that, like to see people who like literally are starving, which I know that everyone knows that there's people across the world that are starving, but it's really different. Like when you hear people that like, I was getting to know these people on a personal level, but to hear like the stories of these people's lives, like they maybe, maybe had one meal to share with their whole family one for one meal a day. Like yeah. that's crazy. That's so, so different than even when people are starving here, like it's really, really still different. And one meal, by the way, is just like some rice. So it's like not really that sufficient. Like there's such deep need, like everything is just, it's so broken. It's such a spiritually depraved country. But then you see like the hope of Christ enter this country and you see people hearing about Jesus. And I was just reading an Acts the other day where um, it's like right after Jesus leaves and Peter and somebody else, they go and they heal this paralyzed man. And instantly he like gets up and he's like celebrating, he's praising Jesus and he's telling all these people about Jesus. Um, It's like an Acts two or something, but that's what it looks like. There is that people find out about Jesus. They have probably some crazy healing, some crazy miracle like that. And then they're just like on board for Jesus. Like these are people that have not heard of him before. And so when they hear like the hope that he has to offer, Something that's so different from the darkness of their country, like that just snaps them out of it, which is crazy because like everyone here is like, yeah, Jesus, he's, he's kind of cool. He's kind of good. Right. Like we kind of know about Jesus and it's not the same way. Like when people hear his name, they're not like bowing down on the floor, but that's what we should be doing because we should be like constantly just refreshed by the hope and who he is Mm. and what he has to offer us. And so to see them, these people that have nothing, And then they're given something that like can answer every problem that they ever have had and ever will have. And he does do that Mm -hmm. for them. Like their lives are just completely changed. Mm -hmm. And like even watching, like hearing the things that these pastors had to say, watching them pray, it's so different. And their faith looks so different because it's just like so much stronger than mine ever could be. Like Sam was one night like up on the stage and he was just like, screaming he was screaming and yeah. even this is really funny actually his nephew said that he sounded like like a screaming mountain goat have you ever seen those videos yeah which was pretty accurate but he was just like shouting about how how good the lord is and how the lord will grow this church and how these people can be a part of it and he's doing that right now and the church in india is going to explode like just saying all these things with like unbelievable confidence Hmm. if i were up on that stage i'd be like yeah god probably probably wants to do this like he might do that he kind of like he's capable sure we'll see what happens but they're just like no he's gonna do this i know god yeah i know that he's good i know he has a plan like that is so different from how i live my life it's so different from how i pray and how i talk about him but he is literally their lifeline he's all that they have so why would they not put every ounce of confidence that they have in the lord i uh I'm also impacted, really impacted by the the prayer life and like everything you're saying. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna make a couple comments here. So, um, when uh, Sam Stevens's daughter, mm-hmm. um, she she shared one time about um, uh, s- some circumstance that happened in India um, where they were at a hospital and they needed um, oxygen, mm-hmm. like oxygen tanks. Um, and it was, uh, it was like the worst situation possible. And it's like, people were going to die if they didn't get oxygen tanks. And so she prayed and uh, I remember her prayer was, Lord, you better bring oxygen tanks. Yeah. (laughs) That sounds exactly like something she'd say. Um, 
and she, she she basically prayed um as jesus says to pray pray as if it has already happened yeah and yeah. so she was like lord where are these you yeah you gotta bring them here now yeah uh, time's running out you need to get them here now almost like i would be like I'm like oh my gosh like yeah but she's not praying for herself yeah she's not praying like something ridiculous she's just like this is intense and lord i know you care about these people make this happen yeah yeah and we'll be waiting for these to come here because i know you're going to come through and they probably did and they did and that was uh mind blown to me like and i started i like i remember that till this day of like when i pray i'm like um lord you're gonna make this happen yeah and if you don't make it happen there's probably a good reason for it yeah you know and so um it seems like people in india have that mindset and it's like how they view god from what you're saying um and if you read stories and read unleashed um you'll understand this aspect even more it's like over here in the western culture in america especially you know we've we view god as like a antibiotic like mm -hmm. you know we'll take him when we need him mm -hmm. um we'll take him to get healed and it's not bad, um, but that's like, you know, the general standard yeah. um, for how Jesus is treated over here. They will treat him like an oxygen tank. Yeah. Like if, uh, if, if we unplug him, we're done. Yeah. Like he's our lifeline. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's how we should treat him. Yeah. It's like I wouldn't be here in my life. Uh, Galatians 2.20, as Paul writes, uh, for I've been crucified with Christ. Yeah. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives yeah. in me. So it's, you know. God is the sole reason I'm here today. And so my life is sold for God and I'm going to be communicating with him and I'm going to treat him as if he is the ultimate, yeah. everlasting, all powerful, almost like the guy that he is. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to treat him the way he says. Yeah. It. Yeah. And, uh, in America, like, like you're saying, it's so easy to be like, Oh, if I'm sick, I'm not going to pray about it. I'm just going to go to the doctor. Yeah. Oh, if I'm I'm depressed, I'm just gonna open up, you know, to my guys about it. Yeah, it's not bad. Definitely go to the doctor. Yeah, definitely open yeah. up to people about it. But why is our first resort to be like, how can I handle this instead yeah. of going to the Lord and yeah. saying, Oh yeah, you can handle this. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you can like, Lord, I pray that, um, I can get healed from this sickness, but I'm also going to make steps that make sense. Like go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's about like uh, fixing our priorities and fixing our minds on uh, on the Lord. Yeah. As uh, like the the teaching with Peter walking on the water. Yeah. Like when I look at everything else around me, I try to focus on like now I'm focused on myself and like my situation. Mm -hmm. But I keep my eyes locked on Christ, and I'm just gonna keep walking towards Him. Yeah. And defying you know natural laws of physics. <laughs> yeah. You know I'm gonna be be defying everything that makes sense if I fix my eyes on Jesus. Yeah. And uh, it seems like they've really adopted that because they have to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes me like every time I hear stories of, about um, people coming back from India or people uh, from India um, undergoing these supernatural 100 percent. The Lord made that happen. Yeah. Situations. Um, it makes me jealous. Like I. Yeah. You know, I want to. View God that way. I Same. want to be like I want to um have my lifeline like be Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um but I'm just so caught up in doing things myself. Yeah. yeah. Um and it's not God's different over here in America. Yeah, he I would say he works differently, mm -hmm. but he's not a different person. Yeah. Um we can treat him the exact same way that uh these people that the guy who was smiling and praising the Lord that he got beat for his faith. Yeah. We can be in that scenario too and praise the Lord when bad things or bad situations or we get persecuted. Um, and we can view God as our lifeline too. Yeah. There's nothing stopping us. Yeah. Um, so it's always a good reminder, um, uh, to hear, um, what the, what the Lord is doing and mm -hmm. what, what the Lord's work looks like over in different parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny because it's like, we look at what God says and we look at who he is and we're like, that's a suggestion. It's a suggestion that God is all powerful and maybe I should pray to him. But there it's like, are you stupid? Like mm -hmm. God is all powerful. In yeah. fact, he just like, I was paralyzed yesterday and I can walk today. Yeah. God is all powerful. Yeah. 
That's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very and mind-blowing. I I got to teach my home church the week after I came back, which was really cool and it was such an awesome passage and I'm really grateful for that. And it was about Jacob and Esau yeah. and whatever, their whole thing, which I will not explain. But something that I I kept thinking about as I was studying for this teaching and with these convictions was was I have all of these doubts about who God says he is. I have these misunderstandings about who he says that he is. And this is why I don't don't have confidence in him. This is why I do not trust the Lord. Because if I knew who God was and I really understood his character, I would no doubt have confidence in him and be able to ask him for these things with just without any any fear, without holding it back at all. And so that's really just like I think throughout this whole thing and like the preparation of me going to India in being there in coming back, it's just like again and again and again, realizing I do not trust the Lord, which I've always known. It, everyone does not trust the Lord, but it's just been shown to me in so many really, really fun ways. And it's just like, I want to know who he is. Mm-hmm. I really do. And I really want to actually believe the things that he says about him. And so I've been like holding on to those verses about help me in my unbelief and enlighten the eyes of my heart to your truths, because mm-hmm. I, I, I really want to know who he is. I want to have confidence in him. I want to stake my life in him. And I'm really the only one who's getting in the way of that Mm. time and time again, because I'm literally silly and I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I agree. You are pretty stupid. Yeah, I am too. And, uh, probably a lot of listeners are stupid too. Yes. Um, but that's what the Lord has saved us from. Yeah. Isn't it true? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for your sacrifice from going to India, Amiya. Uh, I think that's cool, yeah, along with Heidi and Lena. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really cool, doing the Lord's work over there, and especially fighting through that sickness. Yeah, that was fun. It has to be miserable. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to try to get back on track with this podcast. Yeah. And um, so the way we're going to do it, we'll... We will try to do every other week. Um, give us grace during the holiday season. Yeah. But we should have an episode out next week. Tomorrow. Not for our listeners, but tomorrow for us in yeah. reality. We're we hope. going to meet with CJ Gent. So he should uh, be next on the podcast. Um, we'll go through his testimony. Um, but before we go, how can we help out with mm. IGL? Really good question because I wanted to talk about this because, um, okay, sorry. I had a lot of thoughts at the same time. One, like prayer is our biggest asset, of Mm. course. And just, I'm sorry. I'm so excited. I couldn't think. (laughs) Okay. Bible, right? God, he writes that. This is an awful (laughs) answer. (laughs) So sorry. No, and if if you know my dad, you're going to know that I'm basically just copying the things that he says and is excited about. Mm. But, okay, so if you read the Bible, you see from, like, page three that the Lord has this plan to Mm. save all of humanity, right? Yes. In the Abrahamic covenant, you see that he talks about he's going to bless every single nation through Abraham. And I realize that this is common knowledge for some people. But like if you if you look at literally the rest of the Bible, it's this plan of how he's going to save all nations. But then Abraham screws it up and Jacob screws it up and all these people screw it up. And it's like, Lord, how are you going to do that? How are you going to save all the people? There's no way you can reach all these people, especially because you're just working through one family ri- line. Yeah. But boom, then comes Jesus. Okay, so all people can be saved through Jesus. Mm. And why am I talking about this? Why did I just explain the story of the Bible? Because... Because the Lord has a heart for all people. Yes. He doesn't just have a heart for the people that are in your church or in your life or in your state or in your country or whatever. It's for all people. Amen. And it's equal for all people. And he loves all people. And his heart is breaking for all people. As Todd would say, preach it. Yes, exactly. So why then are we just like restricting our ministry to just the things that are literally right in front of us? Mm-hmm. When God is clearly working in India, which is why I was saying earlier that like it's just sweeping through India, the message of grace. Mm. People have never heard it before. The unreached are being reached. Like what, what greater thing could we be involved in? It's, it's insane. And I don't even know. I don't know what I'm saying, but the point is, that's a reason to help out. Yes. Yes. Which is not your question, but the Lord is working there. I'm Mm. so convinced of that. Like this is a place that needs our help because he's working there. Unlike any other thing I've ever seen. 
And how can we do that? Which is exactly a very good question. Prayer. Like I said, prayer. If you go to our church, Freedom Fellowships, you could attend Missions Prayer Breakfast, which I'm also a big hype for because why not call out to the Lord who's the one who can do these things? Yeah. And just like I was saying, be confident and ask him for these things. We meet, I don't remember once how often month. we meet, once a month, Saturday at somebody's house. You could just text me and I will tell you or give you a ride even potentially. You'll get coffee and potentially a donut if you come. But other than that, I think also giving is a huge thing too, monetarily, and anyone can do that. And as my dad or Theo or anyone who repeats them would say, it's like a cheat code to doing ministry because yeah. when you give money, like that really doesn't, it doesn't take that much. Yeah. But the amount that you're helping other people to just like increase that ministry, probably like fourfold if you give like 10 bucks or something. Yeah. It's like you can just sit in your house and you can be like doing ministry through other people, which is really, really cool. And it was actually really cool because one night Sam was making this call for people to sign this board that they were committing to achieve 2040, which is about a church in every village in India by the year 2040. Mm. And so he was calling these pastors to sign this board. But then he was also like, you guys should go sign it because you are supporting this mission also. Like you pray for us and you give to us. Mm. And so he had me and Lena sign the board for our church, which was really cool. But that's just to say like, yeah, we're not over there. We're not doing the grueling hard work, but we can be supporting it and we yeah. can be helping the people that are doing those things. And this is not just like, obviously that's a conviction that I have, but also the Bible literally tells us to do that yeah. and it, it tells us to give. So why would we not want to do that? And mm. why would we not want to help the people where the Lord is doing some amazing, amazing work? Yeah. And I mean, if you're not specifically convicted about India, one, I would, I would, pray that he can show that to you or just if you're convicted about another place or another thing give to them anyway yeah that's what i have to say about that do you know where they can give yes okay so actually on the freedom fellowships website we do have a link to donate to igl if that's easier for you but it would probably just be best to actually go to the igl website which is super fun because you can actually like choose specifically what you want to donate to so you could donate to like buying a cow or buying a Bible or buying some shoes. But if you want to help Freedom Fellowships, we support a village called Rajakati. Mm -hmm. So you can also sign up to have a monthly donation that's going to go to that too, mm -hmm. which does a lot of good. Yeah. I know uh, me and my wife, my wife and I, <laughs> uh, we support a barefoot pastor. Yeah. And uh, we also support a child child sponsor mm -hmm. and so um and uh roger Cotty. so um it's really cool like um getting updates from the yeah. barefooted pastor yeah. and uh i think it's um uh, personally it's awesome to like get uh these handwritten letters from the pastor and like it gets translated because their their handwriting's so immaculate which blows my mind yeah but well, for also the, the our sponsor child getting uh pictures that uh, mm -hmm. he draws um it's really cute and then having like an updated uh, picture of him and yeah uh, seeing the toys that uh we send him and stuff like that yeah and so it's um uh, it's really cool just like to see because like yeah we can't like see it in person i i pray that one day that that could be possible yeah or we can uh be able to meet our sponsored uh sponsored child but mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's cool just getting updated and like uh seeing our money go to something useful and instead of like more chipotle yeah know, yeah it, it's not that expensive it um, really isn't yeah for for one of those things it's really not so yeah i encourage anyone to uh, give it's a, it's a great way to do ministry i agree mm -hmm. it's a cheat code yeah it really is but that'll be it for this podcast uh thank you amia for sharing with yeah. us and tune in next week as we learn more about cj gent and his life story and how he came to know christ and thank you for uh staying tuned and staying updated with us even though we have been faithless <laughs> uh you have been faithful <laughs> amen <laughs> uh that will be it <laughs> <laughs>